Hey, hello ladies, hello, hello. Tonight we are going to be talking about boundaries. Boundaries, part two. Oh yeah, let's do this. I'm hype, uh-huh. So today we're gonna to be talking about the 10 laws of boundaries. 10 laws of boundaries. Okay, and I believe it, is, it will be more helpful if I can try to provide you all with some questions um, to help you process through where you're at um, concerning these 10 laws. So I will attempt to do that. I do have the workbook, so I will probably just be asking you a few questions out of the workbook. And you do have the cheat sheet, uh, which was posted, I believe, earlier today. So just open up that PDF and let's get started. Or you can always check back after, after the live. Okay, so 30 minutes. We'll stick to 30 minutes. All right, so part one, we talked a little bit about the basics of boundaries, and today we're going to talk about the 10 laws of boundaries. Fun stuff, fun stuff. So the first one is the law of reaping and sowing. Um, time for the kids, the little ones to go to bed. The law of reaping and sowing. So, um you know some people understand it differently like you know you get what you give or um payback's a, a bitch um this this idea of whatever you put out right some people say whatever you put out in the universe you know it's going to come back to you um but biblically it's con it's considered the law of reaping and sowing and that's you know, the book itself has a biblical basis. So the law of reaping and sowing is essentially, you know, whatever you give to, right? Whatever thoughts you give to, whatever actions, words you give to, you can expect that there's going to be a, um, a reaping and coming back of whatever put out. So The question here is, are you interfering with the process of reaping and sowing? That's where it becomes a boundary issue. Are you interrupting the process of reaping and sowing? And uh, an example might be, um, you know, your friend. Um, Sorry, my mind is not honing in tonight. Okay, so an example would be as if uh, there somebody does something and there's a consequence that should come to them, but you interfere with them receiving that consequence, that would be considered an example of interrupting that process. So, um, and they explain it usually the people who have issue boundary issues are the ones that interrupt that now in my personal experience i've seen that happen often with you know parents right so your children let's say they don't do their homework um and it's a big it, it's uh it's going to count you know a lot of points towards their grades so the next day they wake up they're like oh i didn't do my homework they really don't have a good excuse it's that they just they didn't they didn't want to do it they didn't discipline themselves whatever you want to call it and so the next day instead of letting them endure the consequences of getting a zero on that assignment the parent will you know stay up late and do the assignment write the paper do the project and then give it to the child to turn in the next day that would be an example of interrupting um, the process of reaping and sowing. And so it goes to explain 
if you are a person that interrupts this process, you can explain to the person. So this parent, right, that interrupted the process can explain to their child the next day, you need to stop this. Now, you know, when you have these big projects, you, you have to do it. You have to get it done. You can talk to your blue in the face, but um, it's not the talking that changes the behavior. It's you stepping out of the way and allowing the natural consequences to happen. That's really the solution. That's the solution. You step out of the way and allow that person to experience the natural consequences. Okay. Next law, the law of responsibility. Okay, so I'll just start off and, and read this here. It says, people react in various ways to a talk on boundaries and taking responsibility for their own lives. Some people respond with, that's so self-centered. We should love one another and deny ourselves. Other people set out on a selfish and self-centered life, and still others begin to feel guilty when they do someone a favor. Okay, so it's explaining that there is a wide range of responses when we hear about the law of responsibility, which essentially is um, exactly that, that we have to take responsibility for what is within our boundaries. And we have to hold others responsible for taking care of their own things, right? What's in their own boundaries. So again, some people are extremely sensitive and feel like that's selfish. Some people are like, oh, that sounds about right. Some people, you know, are on the other spectrum where it's, um, you know, they're, they're, they're experiencing guilt um, when they do help, when they do, you know, share. So this law of responsibility kind of bounces back to the point that was made in part one about um, handling your, what's yours, a load and a burden. Again, my mind, just bear with me tonight. A load and a burden. So the law of responsibility pings back to that. A, a load and a burden. A load is just your daily, you know, what's daily required of you, your daily responsibilities. A burden is when it's something excessive, right? Like when you have um, a big, maybe some big shift, maybe some unexpected something, uh, maybe let's say, um, I'll say your child gets sick, right? And they're very, very sick for maybe a few months. And it's requiring so much more of you than the normal. That would be a burden. And uh, it would be expected that people would help with the burden, right? It's excessive. But when you talk about your daily load, most of that is your responsibility. You can always ask for help occasionally, but the expectation is that you carry your own load and you ask and receive help for the burdens. Okay, but sometimes we mix those up, right? We think every day, everything is a crisis. We have to have help. We can't handle it. And I'll leave it at that. Okay, so the law of responsibility is, is, is just what it says. Accepting your own responsibility and holding others responsible for their responsibilities. Okay. Because the two can be confused. They can be confused. All right, law three, the law of power. Um, am I powerless over my behavior? If I am, how can I be responsible? And what do I have the power to do? So the law of power covers several things and I do have them uh, on the cheat sheet. It talks about one, agreeing with the truth about your problems. Agreeing with the truth, agreeing with what you can see and touch and hear, right? Um, Two, submitting your inability to God. 
right? Because we we are flesh and blood and we do have limitations and there are going to be challenges that we experience that we genuinely need help with. There are things that are or feel like they're beyond our control to fix and those are opportunities for us to um, to share to share those weaknesses with the Lord uh, the third search and ask God to reveal more about what is within your boundaries now I'll this one is pretty much expressing you know especially if you have issues with boundaries a lot of times it's hard to even know what that looks like from day to day what does that look like from you know one relationship to the next relationship and it takes time it's going to be a process of renewal and what it's saying is in this process of um, understanding what is within my power to change and what is outside of my power to change so when we get to acknowledging what seems to be outside of our power to change that's you know certainly portions that we would lift up to the Lord and ask him to come and help us in those areas we need help in the areas that we do have the power to change right but it's a process of renewal um, turning away from the evil that we find within um, we do have the power to turn away from evil, to repent, to turn away from um, bad choices. Um, humble yourself and ask God to meet your needs. It's pretty straightforward. Find those you hurt and make amends. All right. So the law of power is essentially explaining to us that we have to get to the place where we are realistic about where we are and um, about what things we are actually able to change and do and make a decision. Are we going to take responsibility and make the changes for ourselves? And then it's assisting you in the process of doing that. Okay. So, do I have power over this behavior? Can I be responsible? What do I have the power to do? And they made, a, it's a phrase in here, more people suffer from trying to change others than from any other sickness. And it's impossible okay we cannot change anyone else we only have the power to change ourselves and once we acknowledge that and use our energies and efforts to make changes within ourselves that's that's where meaningfulness will come from okay the fourth law the law of respect okay is uh, we need to respect boundaries of others in order to command respect for our own boundaries. That one's pretty straightforward. We have to respect the boundaries of others in order to com command respect for our own. So bouncing back again to part one, this here ties into, um, you know, using manipulation to get what you want from others. And so we'll ask others, um, you know, perhaps we send them on a guilt trip. Um, perhaps we somehow twist it up, you know, so that they feel obligated to somehow do something for us. But if we respect other people's no, then that frees us up to say no and have our no be respected. Okay, five, the law of motivation. These false motives keep us from setting boundaries. Okay, so here are the false motives that keep people from setting boundaries. One, fear of loss of love or abandonment. Okay, I'm not going to have time to go into too much detail, but just listen to these. Something might ping off of your heart. Okay, then that, that'll let you know that this might be um, one that you will have to be prayerful about fear of loss of love or abandonment that's the first one 
Second one, fear of others anger. You're afraid that other people will be angry with you if you set boundaries. Fear of loneliness. You're afraid that if you say no, people won't want to hang around you and you'll be alone. Fear of living a lie. Fear of living a lie. Okay, the next one is guilt. Right, guilt could keep people from setting boundaries. They feel guilty about saying no. They feel guilty about saying they're not comfortable with that or they don't want to do that. Payback. Payback. Approval. Okay. Some people don't set boundaries because they want other people's approval. Uh, over identification with other people's loss. So, um, an example of this might be you know, you know that if you say no, it's going to hurt this person's feelings, and you can't bear for them to hurt, you can't bear for them to be in pain. So, you don't say no. That's the best example I can have. I can give you right now. All right. So that was it for the law of motivation. Okay. Talks about the motives that keep you from setting healthy boundaries. Okay, I didn't do all of the examples justice. I'm going to hop back really quickly. Um, I think payback. I didn't cover payback. Paying back all that you've received. So some people don't set boundaries because they feel like they are you know always in a place where they owe something back right they they've had these people that have loved on them and they feel like they you know are always somehow indebted so tomorrow 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 i need you to go to bed all right six is the law of evaluation which pretty much explains uh, that hurt is not the same as harm. So the example I gave you before, right? I don't say no to someone because I know it's going to hurt them deeply and I don't want to hurt them. But this is where part of the problem can come in. Hurting them is not the same as harming them. So for example, um, I'll use example with, you know, the, the child who didn't do their assignment for the next day. So they might, let's say, come to mom, mom, please, I need help with this. I need help. And you say, um, you've been out playing or video gaming all afternoon. You know, you had plenty of time to do it and you didn't do it. Oh, but mom, please, if I don't get this done, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a failed this class. It's going to be horrible. You will be hurting their feelings to say no. They might be saddened. They might be angered. But you are not harming them by holding them accountable right by allowing them to experience the consequences of their actions because in doing so you are actually helping them to mature because in a real world they're not going to have a buffer wherever you know there there are going to be real consequences for their actions whether they're positive or negative so i hope i'm explaining the law of evaluation is that hurt does not equal harm. You might hurt their feelings, but you're not harming them. You're not hindering their growth. You are 
in essence, in most situations, you will be allowing for them to mature and grow. Okay, seven, the law of proactivity. Every action has equal and opposite reaction. Okay, let me see if I can get us a little more on this one. Okay, so the law of pre proactivity is pretty much explaining that for people who have issues with boundaries, right, who give and give and give, they say yes, they say yes, they say yes. When you get to the place where you begin to say no, or when you get to the place where you're not giving, it's going to be felt, right? There may be some anger um, that is behind that because there has been an imbalance. And maybe you didn't realize there was an imbalance until you, you know, stopped it somewhere. You put a, you put a halt to the imbalance or you took yourself out of the equation um, yes, it is. There is going to be some emotional response, maybe some thoughts um, that are going to come from that. So it's saying that that's to be expected. When you begin to make these changes in the right directions towards setting healthier boundaries, you are going to feel the difference. And it might include some angry, some angry feelings, some ongoing anger, and it may be pretty intense. And it may linger for a little while, but it is normal and it will subside because there has been such an imbalance, right? That now when you're actually, you know, trying to get it back in line, you're like, oh, <laughs> okay. Eight, the law of envy, which focuses on things outside of our boundaries. So the law of envy, you all understand the concept, you know, people who, who say um, the grass is always greener on the other side, but that doesn't stop you from perhaps wanting the greener grass. Even though it may not truly be better, you still want it. So we've made it clear that you only have control of what's within your boundaries your own thoughts your own emotions right your own behaviors your own choices your own words uh, your own feelings and in doing so if you are constantly focused on what on wanting what other people have then you are going to be almost paralyzing yourself because you don't have any control over what other people have. So I'm not saying you can't desire more. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is exert your efforts towards things that are actually within your ability to change. I hope that's clear. Let me see if I can um, get you something more. Here it explains, envy, envy defines good as what I do not possess and hates the good that it has. Right? So for an envious person, if you say what things are good, they're things that you don't have, right? They're what everybody else has. And so that means that in your mind, what you have is not good enough. And if you keep that mindset, 
It's destructive because it will guarantee that you will not get what you want and it'll just keep you constantly dissatisfied, right? So it's almost like the mindset will keep you from taking the steps necessary to have better relationships, to have better boundaries because all your thoughts are on, hey, what they have is great and what I have is not. All right, nine, the law of activity. It pretty much is explaining that time. We have boundary problems because we lack initiative, the God given ability to propel ourselves into life. So in this instance, uh, the law of activity pretty much says we have to do our part. We have to do something. We can't be passive. We cannot, um, we cannot be bystanders in our own lives. We have to do something, even if it's awkward at first, right? Even if it doesn't come out the way you want it to, we have to do something. We can't be paralyzed by fear. We can't be paralyzed by, I'm sure there's a, a several other emotions and situations where you're in your mind, you're like, I'm just gonna sit and hope that this gets better, but that won't be helpful. You have to, to do something. That's the law of activity. And 10, the law of exposure. Um, our boundaries must be visible and communicated. They must be visible and communicated. So we have to make them visible to others and communicate it to them in the relationships. So again, this can be very difficult when you have issues setting boundaries, right? Because making your boundaries visible, some you can easily make visible, right? Hey, my door is closed. <laughs> that means don't come in, right? Um, but for the most part, I think the issue that most of us may have is the boundaries that you can't see and those boundaries will have to be communicated. So when somebody doesn't honor your boundary or they cross your boundary, you have to communicate that. You have to say something. Um, Yes, because it talks about secret boundaries, right? We know we have this boundary, but nobody else has it. We cannot expect people to be mind readers. We have to communicate it. We have to communicate it. So with words is great, but again, it may not always be that simple that you just communicate it with words. Sometimes people know they've crossed a boundary because they get sucker punched. They get slapped, they get kicked, you know, they get pushed. So uh, I think this last one is, is, is very challenging for a lot of you, um, but I'll read this. It says the biblical mandate is to be honest and be in the light, okay? So because of our fears, um, we may hide aspects of ourselves in the darkness, but then that gives the devil an opportunity, an opportunity to deceive, to twist things up, to cause more um, separation or distance in our relationships. So just take that to heart and perhaps think about a boundary or a limitation that you have that you have not been clearly communicating with others and perhaps write out if it's easier for you write out a few responses practice them maybe with a safe a safe person someone you trust somebody that you feel comfortable being honest and open with and then 
communicate it effectively to the person who needs to hear it. Okay, so I hope this has helped some. Um, when, in, in my mind, one of the biggest takeaways is to be accepting that there are boundaries. I have what's mine, you have what's yours. And at the end of the day, I only have control over what's mine. And you should be allowed to take responsibility for what's yours. I should honor that. Okay, I should honor mine, I should honor yours. And in doing so, that requires that I communicate, that I am clear, meaning I don't play these funny mind games. I don't try to manipulate. I don't try to keep secrets. I don't expect anyone to mind read. But I am open and honest about what I'm okay with and what I'm not okay with. Okay, ladies, so I hope that has helped you some tonight. I look forward to doing this again next week. All right, good night.